Good morning, everyone, and welcome um, to the George Washington University and the Elliott School of International Affairs in their virtual space. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cook, and I direct the Institute for African Studies here at the Elliott School at GW. Uh, the Institute serves as a hub to connect activities, research, discussions, and debate on Africa across the university um, and to connect the university with the broader Africa policy um, and Africa international affairs community um, in Washington, D.C. and beyond. Um, we are delighted today to be co-hosting this event with the Humanitarian Action Initiative, which uh, Mariam Delof will introduce in just a moment. And I just want to thank our audience uh, for joining us here today and our panelists who, in the midst of a very busy time, have taken time uh, to be with us today. So I'll turn to Mariam for, to introduce the Human Humanitarian Action Initiative. Thank you. My name is Mariam Sarnagar Delof, and I'm the uh, director of the Humanitarian Action Initiative, which, as Jennifer has explained, is the research. Uh, we, we are also a research uh, and academic hub that convenes uh, all activity on humanitarian action and humanitarian affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs. I'm really pleased uh, to be here with you today, and thank you to all of our panelists for joining, and thank you to our audience members for taking the time this morning to learn more about this crisis that unfortunately has not been getting a lot of media coverage in the United States, and uh, for raising public awareness about this uh, conflict. Great. So today's uh, event is uh, focused on Ethiopia's Tigray conflict, um, the humanitarian and political dimensions. Um, there are multiple axes of conflict and dispute in today's Ethiopia. Uh, these reflect the long-standing tensions between an impetus for a centralized state uh, versus those forces demanding greater autonomy for regional states and ethnic groupings. As I say, today we're focusing on the conflict between the Ethiopian state and the government of Tigray, uh, which over the last year has seen a steady ratcheting up of tension and recriminations, um, ostensibly precipitated by the indefinite postponement of elections, but reflecting, and we'll hear about this, much deeper structural issues. Uh, these tensions came to a head in early November. Uh, when Tigrayan People's Liberation Front attacked a federal military base uh, in Tigray and the Ethiopian National Defense Force launched a, an attack on the Tigrayan capital of Mekele. Um, there are fears of continued escalation and expansion into the broader region, uh, but already the humanitarian toll that is taken in terms of uh, trauma, injury, death, and displacement is enormous. One of the problems of this is that uh, information coming out is uh, and communication uh, has been very difficult. Um, so we're very pleased to have uh, today uh, panelists who uh, not only are experts in their own right, but also have networks on the ground with whom they're communicating and gathering information. So these are people with very long resumes. I'll try to keep these uh, uh, introductions fairly short. We're going to begin with Elizabeth Hume, who's vice president at the Alliance for Peacebuilding. Uh, this is a nonpartisan network of about 130 organizations working in 181 countries to end violent conflict and sustain peace. Uh, she directs the policy and advocacy program, uh, but she has a long career in conflict prevention, uh, worked with the International Rescue Committee um, in Afghanistan, I believe, in Pakistan on, on refugees and displaced and for four years as the chief of party for PACT in Ethiopia. We will then turn to Patrick Youssef, who is the regional director for Africa at the Committee of, of uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. Patrick joined ICRC in 2005. He's completed missions in Sudan, Chad, Iraq, Guantanamo Bay, uh, senior roles in operations in Yemen, Iran, again, uh, many more, uh, but he became a deputy regional director for Africa in 2016 and uh, where he managed uh, operations in the Maghreb, Sahel, Lake Chad, and he's now the regional director for Africa. We'll then turn to Beza Tesfai, who's director of research and learning uh, in migration and climate change at Mercy Corps. Uh, Beza will talk about Mercy, what Mercy Corps is seeing on the ground in Ethiopia. 
Bezes, Director of Research and, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I, meant, I already said that. Um, her research has focused on migration, governance, and peace building, and she's conducted field work in a multitude of settings, including Ethiopia. Finally, we'll turn to Hardin Lang, who is Vice President for Programs and Policy at Refugees International. Uh, Hardin um, is a veteran of six UN peacekeeping and humanitarian field missions. He's worked in Afghanistan, the Balkans, Central America, Gaza, uh, on and on, um, and in West Africa. He, he joined the uh, uh, mission in Mali um, and served as head of office uh, in, in Haiti. Uh, worked on the UN mission in Afghanistan. Um, these are all people with a great deal of experience in humanitarian affairs and, and in conflict and, and peace building. We're really delighted to have them with us to talk about um, uh, the Ethiopian conflict. With that uh, uh, very condensed intro, I will to lead us off on the kind of political outlines of the, uh, the conflict. Thank you. Sam. It's such a pleasure to be here. And unfortunately, uh, to talk about Ethiopia today, uh, we have a number of us, Beza and I have been writing and talking about Ethiopia in the last two years. Um, and unfortunately, this is an example of, we, we knew these trends were happening um, and the international community really hasn't paid a significant amount of attention to it. So I really appreciate this forum today. Um, but to understand where we are now, it's really important to uh, go back and look at the conflict dynamics uh, from the past. Um, so, you know, as you all know, Ethiopia has sat on conflict watch lists very at a high level. Um, you know, due to the systemic and longstanding social economic development challenges, uh, you know, they've sat and hovered around 19, uh, sometimes around 20 on a conflict watch list. And that's actually quite high. Um, but it doesn't tell the whole story because the reason why Ethiopia, I never, uh, as long as the EPRDF was in charge, I never thought that there would be violent conflict there. Uh, because in order to have conflict in terms of the equation, you also have to look at the resiliency. And so while there were high grievances, uh, you know, looking at, let's say, their drought and human rights issues and, um, you know, uh, ethnic issues, um, the EPRDF held a really hard uh, grip on uh, the country. And more so after 2007 as well, after 2006, 2007, when they had the elections there um, and they had opened up the system to uh, more political op op um, opposition, they were quite shocked uh, that, uh, that, you know, the country didn't love them, let's say. Um, and so after that, there was even more significant amount of crackdown um, on uh, Ethiopians. Now remember who the EPRDF was, who they were really, uh, who really led them. It was the TPLF. Um, those were, you know, that that's the Tigrayan party. Um, they had fought really hard against the Derg uh, for a long time, um, and they really felt like, you know, they they deserved power. They deserved um, to be able to control, um, even though they are about six percent of the population, because they had fought so hard. So that was a really big theme within their government there. And when you would talk to government officials, um, I was there from about um, uh, 2007, um, I left in 2012, but I was there for that really um, pretty hard crackdown um, after those elections. So, you know, their high resiliency rate, it doesn't mean that it's a good thing, like good resiliency, it's, can be, it can be bad resiliency. Um, and really that focused on their um, security apparatus and their structure that went down to the local level. Um, you know, when living in Ethiopia, you didn't fear crime. It was uh, incredibly safe to live there. Uh, you know, they knew pretty much everything that was going on. But again, it was because of this really um, incredible uh, security apparatus that they had. And one of the things that plays into this conflict right now is that 
right after the 2006, 2007 elections when the EPRDF did so bad, um, but took those elections back, um, they put together a, a CSO law, which is one of the most draconian charities um, law that was around at the time. Uh, and uh, really what it did is they wanted no programming or funding around um, rights issue based. Um, anything that could be seen as democracy, conflict, everything had to be development. So because of that, even the program that I was running, it shouldn't have been running. Um, and we had to work very closely with the government um, to be able to see how we could work. Um, but that really hampered a lot of um, after um, the new prime minister came in after 2018, none of these programs were set up. There were no governance programs. There were everything was really a lot humanitarian based um, because of the CSO law, even though it has been undone. Um, but it also shows that why after 2018, it took the international community a very long time to pivot and to be able to work on these issues, whether it would be conflict, reconciliation, uh, governance issues that were needed uh, pretty significantly. Um, and, and so in some regard, it's the international's fault, the international community's fault that, you know, after 2018, everybody was cheering about these political transformations, um, but there wasn't a lot of assistance that went in there, the assistance that was needed. Um, and, but again, it was because a lot of these structures weren't there, um, and that can go back to that CSO um, law that was put together. So now, you know, moving fast forward, um, you know, in 2018, we Ethiopia had a new prime minister, and there was this significant opening up of uh, governance, and political opposition was allowed to come back. But you're also seeing some of the serious cracks, and you can see the. Um, you know, you can already see uh, the cracks that are happening and some of the, the, the issues that are leading us today between um, uh, the prime minister's government and the TPLF. So, um, you know, Prime Minister Abe, he, uh, you know, put together this new political party uh, with, you know, the theme of coming together. He pulled out some of the ethnic, uh, the larger ethnic groups from um, the EPRDF, the TPLF obviously did not like this. Um, so, you know, that that's you're starting to see some of the cracks again. Um, Abe also dismantled the security apparatus. Um, and that has had significant impact in Ethiopia because it has allowed local conflicts to um, become much more large scale. Um, you have a lot of ethnic fighting. Uh, people within more marginalized ethnic groups feel that the central government can't protect them. So you're seeing more of this um, uh, conflict rising up that had been sort of pushed down. So, you know, a couple of other key points um, is that you're also seeing these regional states flexing their muscles. Um, and you've seen it even outside of Tigray. Uh, uh, Sadama actually had a vote and voted overwhelmingly. A part of the constitution is that you can have more autonomy. Um, and they voted overwhelmingly for that. So there's a real fear that you're going to start seeing more of that. Um, and, you know, you're seeing people close ranks within your ethnic groups. Um, and, uh, and you saw Tigray, um, they ignored an arrest warrant for Gatachu Asef. Um, who had been the former chief of intelligence, who was fired by Abe um, and had been accused of serious human rights abuses. So you're seeing these regional states starting to, you know, flaunt their muscles and their power. And Tigray was no exception to that. Um, you know, also uh, the TPLF saw the, you know, um, pr uh, Prime Minister Abe won the Nobel Peace, Ar uh, Peace Prize for uh, the work that they did to stop the conflict or end the conflict with Eritrea. And the TPLF really saw this um, as nothing more than a conspiracy against them, so against them um, because, you know, they're sworn enemies uh, uh, with Eritrea. And so just a couple of other things. Um, what does this all mean then in terms of why did we also see, you know, we could see this coming? Right now, you know, Ethiopia has a high dependence on aid. 
Um, and what did the Trump administration do recently? They cut off aid to Ethiopia. While they are allowing humanitarian aid, they've cut off the very aid that Ethiopia needs right now. The, you know, the small amount of governance and reconciliation programming um, and, uh, you know, to address some of these grievances that it actually really needs. Um, and that's because of the dam. Um, and we knew that dam was coming. We knew we've known for over a decade when I was in Ethiopia, every Ethiopian was paying into that dam um, through like a bond system, even if it was just a couple of burr. Um, so this dam is very much of a national pride. Um, and we know that uh, there, you know, there, there is an issue right now with Egypt. Um, so you're also taking away something that's very much about national pride. Um, uh, so, you know, as I'm kind of going through these things, um, you know, it's also important to remember that there are you're seeing these clashes in Ethiopia. You're also seeing challenge to um, Prime Minister Abe, even with his in, within Oromo. Um, and so there is a lot of internal conflicts going on. So, uh, you know, a lot, you know, a lot of people are like, well, why are you picking, you know, why is this happening with the TPLF? And, you know, there, there is a case to be made that, you know, if you don't want people to be paying attention to what's going on over here, you know, it, it makes you want to um, do something somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, that's also one of the issues to think about is, you know, why now? Um, um, you know, obviously the postponement of the elections has been critical. We've seen it May, October. Um, you know, this is a real problem because it also means the delegitimacy of this government as well. And so, you know, there are, you know, there's both sides to it, but understanding that these issues um, didn't just happen because of a military uh, uh, clash, um, for example. And then just one more thing, um, you know, understanding that the longer that this takes to resolve, um, you know, Daniel Bekele, who is now the human rights commissioner um, in Ethiopia, we um, had him in Mercy Corps and, and a bunch of uh, us had a um, discussion with him last summer. He came to Washington um, and we had an event at AFP. And, you know, remember that Daniel spent years and years in prison uh, by the EPRDF. Um, and, you know, so, you know, it's not to say that these people aren't neutral and incredible people, but, you know, you have to remember that, you know, they were imprisoned, um, they were the opposition. Um, and um, as we see the um, uh, human rights abuses or in the one town up in um, uh, Tigray where um, Daniel led a human rights commission um, up there to take a look at what actually happened um, and saying that, you know, people were slaughtered up there. Um, you know, you have to remember that there's a really long history between all of these people and they know each other well. Um, you know, they've, they've been fighting or working together um, for a long time. So I'll stop there. Um, but just to also remember that because the TPLF really did, uh, they were in control of the EPRDF. You have to remember that a significant amount of military, I think within the military, there were 60% of the officers were from the TPLF. You know, as you're trying to dismantle that hold, on the TPLF, it's going to obviously be causing a lot of problems. But also remember, there's a lot of military hardware up in Tigray um, because of the conflict with Eritrea and because the TPLF um, was in control and the fact that they have a long history of fighting the Derg um, in a guerrilla style. So, you know, even though they captured Michele, it doesn't mean that this is over. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Liz. That is a great kind of framing for the discussion. Um, uh, Patrick, we'll turn to you for ICRC's perspective and what, you're, what they're seeing on the ground. Thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thanks for having us, uh, for allowing um, this to, um, to also focus on the humanitarian situation and the conditions in which people are uh, living, unfortunately, in today, Michele. I would have to start 
by really acknowledging the complexity of this crisis. I hope you can hear me. Um, the complexity of the crisis and the difficulty to get uh, to understand what's really happening on all fronts. So, um, indeed, as you said, Jennifer, I'm going to really focus on what we hear from our team on the ground inside Michele, uh, our teams, but also the ones of the Ethiopian Red Cross. So, um, let me start by again acknowledging that we are seeing the fact that north of Ethiopia is back on, in the news or is today a center stage in the, the world news for what is known to be, and Liz has mentioned it very clearly, an environment of growing tensions with deeply rooted disagreements, unresolved issues that have led to the situation we are in today. And in unfortunately, in just one month, we're really one month since the beginning of this crisis, the 4th of November and today the 4th of December, the fighting in, uh, in this region, in the Tigray region, has really triggered a humanitarian crisis that is likely to worsen uh, so long as clashes continue and expand. Uh, and as you said, Jennifer, the human toll is really getting higher and higher. And the more we scratch the surface, the more we learn about the, uh, the complexity, the difficulty for an Ethiopian today to live in that uh, part of the country. Uh, I think that Michele today is really calm, although it is really calm. Uh, we know that there are pockets of fighting in the region uh, and uh, around the capital city. And it's important here to remember that since over now three, four weeks, people there have lived with First, tremendous uncertainty for the past uh, number of days without being in contact with their family members, without phone, without internet, without electricity, and sometimes without fuel. And all of these essential uh, social services are just interrupted. And they kind of add to the suffering, to the toll and suffering on uh, every day's uh, life. And you've seen it, you've heard it as well, hundreds are um, are uh, streaming into uh, Sudan, and there's an un, uh, untold number of uh, internally displaced that are unfortunately within the Tigray region. We don't have today a comprehensive picture of the total displacement, unlike other contexts in northern Mozambique or in the Sahel region where we would immediately have that overview, that assessment. Um, we don't have these figures for the time being. However, we did we did send uh, teams to visit the areas north of Amhara and west of Tigray, specifically Danesha and Abirafi, and we found thousands of internally displaced people without, uh, you know, the basics, without food, without water, medical care, sheltering, etc. And the team today had reported to to us that uh, they just finished the first distribution in Abirafi. And they will continue during the weekend to complete uh, rations or essential household items uh, and food rations for 7,300 internally displaced. There will be more in case of need. Uh, standby material is, is available in Addis and can be indeed brought to, to Michele. I'd like to add <clears throat> on the displacement of population, we shouldn't, populations, we shouldn't forget that Eritrean refugees have, uh, have also crossed into uh, the uh, the Tigray region. There are about 1,000, at least that's what we hear, and the estimates suggest that there's a, a little bit more than 1,000 who have come to Mekele fle fleeing um, fighting that broke around the camps in uh, Shire. Uh, they were, for the time being, reliant on aid that has come from our office. They Some visited our offices in Mekele and did get whatever was available, and then we're into looking into uh, bringing some more assistance. As I said, we have an office in Michele uh, with the Ethiopian Red Cross volunteers who haven't stopped working during all this crisis. Cars, vehicles, ambulances have continued working, transporting uh, sick and wounded or um, uh, the dead as well. Um, and I'm going to share a few of their observations here. One, I'll just focus on hospitals and healthcare facilities, which are which were and are continuously continue running dangerously low on medical assistance, medical supplies. Um, they've been receiving large number of wounded and uh, sick, and also receiving uh, amputees, uh, people who suffered from amputations and now need 
some form of physical rehabilitation. Um, you know, after a month of disrupted um, supply chain into Mekele, these hospitals, the, at least the ones that we visited, and I, and I will name a few, are running, as I said, dangerously low and are also disregarding other critical cases that are knocking on their doors. Our team, for example, visited IDER Reference Hospital uh, in Mikhail a few days uh, ago and found it again to be in the same situation. About 80% of their current uh, patient load were uh, trauma injuries, as we also portrayed in our public communication. In this referral, referral hospital, we're seeing that the hospital is lacking you know, simple things, gloves, painkillers, sutures, and antibiotics, for example. Um, and again, uh, just reflecting on what our teams have, have seen on the ground, with this situation perpetuating and even taking a little bit longer, one would just imagine how emergency care and other medical services could, in fact, be suspended if the situation continues as it is. Um, the hospitals are also low, uh, running low on body bags and uh, certainly food to cater for the other needs, not only for trauma uh, patients. One of our teams visited uh, five health facilities in the north of Amhara. And again, these, that's a collection area with these hospitals receiving some moderate or severe uh, injuries. We've done the same exercise in eastern Amhara late November uh, for the same purpose. And these facilities are also receiving injured from the eastern part of the Tigray region. Um, we've been also checking on patients who suffered, as I said, some amputations, trying to register them as quickly as possible because of their injuries, and because they also need a referral to a physical rehabilitation service that we've been supporting since years in the country. Um, I'd just like to, uh, to finish with two, uh, two pieces of information that also give you an, uh, um, an analysis, a visual about the immensity, the tremendous needs that we see uh, every day. Our, our offices in Ethiopia have received over 5,000 requests from people all over the world to connect with their loved ones within the Tigray region. So families in Geneva, in Europe, uh, also in Africa, connecting with us and trying to get family news. Uh, some have succeeded, 1,500 managed to get connected through the service that we put, uh, put out there with satellite phones, with also uh, safe and well messages that we provide uh, to the families and through our network of volunteers across the world. Uh, and that has been, and that is ongoing. I would add the same for the Sudan crisis. The refugees that have crossed into Sudan have also received uh, these, uh, these services. And I would add uh, maybe in one aspect uh, that uh, everyone knows that the work of the ICRC is not only about distributing food and water, but also about protecting people, about protecting the most vulnerable in the communities, those who are wounded and sick, but also those who are detained, those who lost their liberty because of the fighting. So we managed to visit people detained in relation to the fighting to assess their treatment uh, and conditions. We managed also to bring some assistance we shouldn't forget that the coronavirus hasn't uh, vanished yet. So we, as we did uh, prior uh, to this crisis, creating cordons of security around places where physical distancing is impossible, like places of detention or internally displaced camps. And there that action has continued in favor of those arrested because of the crisis. And again, as I said, our uh, local partner, the Ethiopian Red Cross has been incredibly, uh, incredibly competent, present, um, and quick in responding to the needs, and as I said, haven't stopped uh, working, uh, which is a very positive sign that shows that the dialogue with, uh, with the authorities has been fruitful and helped us at least remain operational in this uh, part of Ethiopia. Thank you. Back to you, Jennifer. Great. Um, thank you so much, Patrick. And we've got questions coming in already, so um, we're <laughs> we, um, we'll be circling back. Um, Beza, let's turn um, turn to you from Mercy Corps' perspective. Okay. Good morning. Um, thank you, Jennifer, and uh, thank you, everyone, for for convening this discussion. Um, as Liz mentioned, I think it's really important and timely. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, I work for Mercy Corps, which um, is a humanitarian and development organization. We've been in Ethiopia since 2004. 
Um, because we are a humanitarian organization, by principle, we remain neutral in a conflict situation which exists. So our primary focus is really on providing life-saving support to affected communities. At Mercy Corps, our approach really focuses on first addressing immediate humanitarian concerns while also building the resilience of communities to better cope and eventually transform underlying causes um, of these problems. Uh, in my view, the challenges in Ethiopia are both acute and protracted. Uh, the immediate humanitarian needs stemming from the conflict in Tigray. But over the past year, Ethiopia has also been facing multiple other challenges, some of which are recurrent, but some of which are also new. And these have also contributed to food insecurity, displacement and violence. So in, in my time, I kind of want to touch on some of the immediate humanitarian needs that we're seeing in Tigray, but also situate them in this broader set of challenges that Ethiopia has been facing. And I want to intentionally focus um, not on the political dimensions, as this has really covered that, and more on the humanitarian dimensions uh, of, of the challenges in Ethiopia and their underpinning. Um, so first, with regards to the situation in Tigray, uh, because Mercy Corps was not uh, active in the region prior to the conflict, it didn't really have an immediate effect on our operations. Um, however, we have a team in Ethiopia that has been closely monitoring the situation. One challenge that we um, observe is that it's been difficult for the most part for humanitarian agencies to be able to gain access and work in the region, um, primarily due to the fighting. Last week, the government of Ethiopia announced its intention to scale up humanitarian assistance within the region and actually provide an access route for um, humanitarian agencies that would be managed by the Ministry of Peace. And as many of you might know, a couple of days ago, the UN and the government of Ethiopia uh, formalized an agreement that would make this possible. Um, so given these commitments and, of course, given the end of the military operation, we are hopeful that we will be able to access the region fairly soon, but that has yet to be the case. So from where we stand now, it's, as Patrick was saying, it's really unclear what the full toll of the conflict has been and what the humanitarian needs are, um, because as, as you all know, there has been a communication blackout in, in the region. But some early assessments that we've seen indicate that hundreds of thousands have been displaced. Uh, either internally or to Sudan, and key infrastructure such as roads and airports have been damaged. Um, some specific groups that are most at risk include Eritrean refugees, as well as those within Tigray that were already reliant on food aid because there haven't been any um, aid deliveries in the past month or so. Uh, for Mercy Corps, so far, our response has been to date in Sudan. We are working in Umra Kuba refugee camp, which currently hosts about 8,000 of the uh, estimated 45,000 refugees that have fled to Sudan. And in, in that camp, we've been providing health and wash water sanitation and hygiene services to, um, to the refugees. We understand that UNHCR is working on expanding Umra Kuba um, because its current capacity is, is 10,000, and as I mentioned, it's already at 8,000. Um, and this is in order to accommodate the expected flows of up to perhaps uh, 100,000 refugees in the coming weeks. Uh, and then within Ethiopia, we are seeking ways in which we could support IDPs that might be uh, moving to bordering regions such as Amara and Afar, where we do have, um, we do have a presence on the ground, and so we're able to very quickly um, pivot and, and support IDPs. Uh, but so far, the movements that we've been seeing to these other regions within Ethiopia have been really small scale relative to what we've been expecting. Um, so, as I mentioned, the fallout of the conflict in Tigray is the immediate concern of Mercy Corps, and, and we are mobilizing to help address it. But simultaneously, we do recognize the broader context and the need to address a number of other challenges that Ethiopia has been facing. Uh, prior to the current crisis, over 15 million people throughout Ethiopia were already in need of humanitarian assistance, including 8 million people that were in need of food aid. And according to the International Organization for Migration, IOM, there were 1.85 million IDPs 
in Ethiopia um, as of September 2020. So again, prior to the conflict in Tigray. We know that the two main causes of displacement are first conflict, which accounts for 64% of this displacement. And then secondly, environmental disasters, uh, specific, specifically drought and flooding, which accounts for another 34% of this uh, displacement. In terms of conflict, we see intercommunal conflict or clashes in almost all of the regions, but most notably in uh, the Southern Nations, Nationalities and People region, and also in Oromia, um, and in particular along a lot of the regional borders um, of, of the state, such as along the Afar Somali border, the Oromia Somali border, um, and within SSNPR. At the core, um, this issue is often linked to livelihood concerns as um, people from different communities are often in disputes over access and rights to land and other natural resources that we know are being depleted over, um, over time due to climate change and also because of overuse. But when these conflicts are unresolved, they become politicized, they become more violent, and then oftentimes they become intractable leading to the mass displacement that we've been seeing in Ethiopia over the years. In addition, this year has been uniquely difficult, I would say, because of the convergence of three simultaneous shocks that have further strained livelihood, increased food insecurity and displacement, and thereby heightened the risk of conflict. Um, the first is the desert locust outbreak, which has been the worst in 25 years. This has damaged over 800 square miles of cropland and over 5,000 square miles of pasture land, which has pushed at least 1 million people into food insecurity. And areas that have been hardest hit include Somali, Oromia, Afar regions, but of course Tigray has also been affected by this. With 75% of the workforce in Ethiopia reliant on agriculture, it's really hard to overemphasize the devastation that the desert locust outbreak has, has brought to the country. The second shock um, I would um, I would group as environmental disasters. In particular, unusually heavy rainfall has led to flooding, which has again resulted in the loss of crops, loss of livestock, and displacement. Um, and earlier this year, during the the recent rainy season, we saw floods in Afar that um, affected nearly one million people. And then, thirdly, at the same time, Ethiopia, of course, is also fighting the global COVID-19 pandemic um, and the restrictions on travel that have been put in place to sort of curb the spread of the virus have also further affected livelihoods and food security. So you have all of these uh, shocks um, putting a strain on a situation that was already quite fragile due to a lot of the social and political cleavages that, that existed in the country. These issues are complex and they are interconnected. Um, addressing them really requires a long-term strategy to alleviate the immediate needs while also building capacities at different levels to better cope with future shocks. And Mercy Corps' resilience approach is really um, a framework that tries to align and improve the coherence of international responses through humanitarian, peace building, and development efforts because all three are really needed in a context like Ethiopia. And we work with local actors and institutions, both formal and informal, to address, again, the underlying causes of these vulnerabilities. As one example, we have a program in Afar, Somali, and Oromia regions um, that's focused on improving livelihoods and uh, peace and security. And uh, we do things like we, we help stimulate um, agriculture and livestock markets. We increase um, information, climate information services, we strengthen um, participatory resource management and land tenure, and then we also work at the local level to help identify and preemptively resolve disputes. So this type of multi-pronged approach, we believe, can contribute um, alongside the broader economic and political reforms that are also necessary. Uh, it can contribute to long-term peace and stability. So to conclude, uh, as Ethiopia continues to undergo this really important yet fragile transition, international support needs to be concerted and sustained, and again, addressing the immediate crisis in Tigray, but also thinking about how we can work over future crises uh, throughout Ethiopia. Thank you so much. Over to you, Jennifer.
Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Beza. And thank you for making the point that this is kind of an additional layer on layer upon layer of vulnerability, displacement, uh, food insecurity, um, and, you know, straining the capacities of a humanitarian response. Um, I want to turn to Hardin, who's got kind of the big picture, um, <clears throat> put out a recommendations uh, just uh, last week for the broader humanitarian response that goes to some of that um, that you've just laid out, Beza. So Hardin, thank you for joining and over to you. Jennifer, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here, uh, and it's a real sort of honor to be on a panel with such distinguished panelists who also have sort of their finger on the pulse of events in, uh, on the ground, which we really, I mean, that's very hard to get your uh, hands on these days, that kind of information, and so we're lucky to have them. Um, I was going to, since I was asked to talk a bit about sort of the, the bigger picture from a humanitarian perspective, uh, particularly at a regional level, uh, I was actually going to start exactly where Beza left off in terms of understanding that this crisis in Tigray and the conflict uh, and the humanitarian uh, crisis that it has uh, produced is occurring inside of an incredibly fragile regional environment where the three crises that she went through, the locust swarms, COVID-19 and flooding, have all sort of cascaded on top of one another uh, to to uh, further undermine the regional humanitarian situation. For example, on the locust swarms, you talk about the fact that you, uh, you're affecting a million people, if not more, inside of Ethiopia. At a regional level, we're looking at perhaps 2.5 million people who have been impacted. And this is in a region where already 25 million are, are, are food insecure. So uh, what you're seeing in Ethiopia in terms of the, uh, the impact of these three crises colliding is rippling out indeed across the region. Um, this is happening everywhere from like COVID-19, which has disrupted and impacted uh, humanitarian supply chains uh, into countries in the region um, to actually, you know, getting into destroying jobs, economies, increasing the number of people who require humanitarian assistance. All those things that we've seen in different parts of the world playing out uh, in, in the Horn and in East Africa at large. Uh, and then again, obviously coupled with the flooding, which has had very significant impact in Somalia, Ethiopia, Kenya and Burundi. Um, so you've got the conflict in Tigray, then beginning to spill out of Tigray into the region, into this highly fragile environment. And there are two countries in particular, before circling back to Ethiopia, there are two countries in particular I wanted to touch on. The first is in Sudan, where we've heard, I and mean, there's pretty good reporting, and most people will probably be aware of the situation with the refugees. You know, we're at about 45,000 uh, who, who uh, Ethiopians who have come across the border uh, into uh, Sudan. Um, What's interesting is that the initial estimates over the you know, in the coming months, we were quite worried uh, that that was going to go up to about two hundred thousand. Uh, and so there was we were looking at the more the more intense periods of combat and people sort of really streaming across. And we thought we were going to get pretty high. And now the estimates have sort of been triggered down to closer to one hundred thousand. So uh, that's not necessarily good news, but it's better news than what we had at least uh, you know uh, a week or two ago. Uh, but that's also premised on the idea that people can still get across uh, and that also we're not necessarily seeing heightened guerrilla conflict taking on throughout Tigray. So, and that's still an open question. One of the challenges we've heard from a lot from the lockers inside of uh, Sudan is this question of where people are going, right? Because the area is quite remote when they come out, these refugees come across the border into Sudan. Uh, there's only been one real camp established is the Rokuba site, you know, which is very close to capacity, and it's a good 70 kilometers away from the border. So this question of how we're going to house people, how we're going to shelter people, particularly because many of them want to remain along the border because they're concerned about their relatives, they're concerned about getting back to their crops, just that question is going to continue to sort of resonate inside the humanitarian community um, in weeks and months to come. Um, you know, as people most most people know, the uh, UNHCR has put out an appeal for about 150, it's actually 147 million dollars to address the crisis. Uh, we're still pretty underfunded on that point, and that's something that I think we all need to be looking at uh, in terms of support for international efforts to work with the government of Sudan uh, to uh, deal with this refugee crisis. Um, I, the generally, in general, the opinion is that Sudan has responded relatively well to the situation. You know, the government has given Ethiopians prima facie refugee status, uh, and Sudan's refugee commission or has been working quite well and in partnership with NGO and UN community from what we're hearing. And so, so far, so good. Um, however, just going back to some of the best points, you know, 
Sudan already, whole, already hosts uh, 1.1 million refugees um, and they've gone through, you know, they're running at 200% annual inflation, massive currency depreciation, fuel shortages, all of this compounded by COVID-19. Uh, in terms of food insecurity, it's the highest level ever recorded in Sudan, which is saying something. And there are over 12.7 million people in need of humanitarian assistance, um, uh, an increase of one third uh, compared to last year inside of Sudan. So again, an extremely sort of chronic fragile situation inside of Sudan in which this acute uh, uh, crisis of the displacement of, of Ethiopians is taking place. Um, that people are watching and concerned about inside of Sudan, negative impacts on host communities, relationships with host communities, where that's going to go. Um, worried a little bit about the rainy season and what that's going to, how it's going to make hosting sites for the displaced inaccessible. There's a lot of concern about armed elements mixing with civilians. We hear a lot from people who've been debriefed, refugees have been debriefed inside of Sudan, that they're concerned that there are armed elements in some of those areas. Um, and then again, obviously, the COVID out, potential for COVID outbreak in those displaced communities uh, really does raise, you know, sort of some some longer some uh, longer term concerns. The other country that we're watching, uh, and it's less to do. It's interesting because it's not so much to do with the humanitarian uh, outflux in terms of uh, of refugees leaving, but is Somalia, where it's the question of Ethiopian troops uh, being pulled out and coming back into the country. Uh, and back to Ethiopia to sort of deal with the situation there. And there the concern is uh, Somalia, an incredibly fragile humanitarian environment, going through a whole series of different uh, uh, shocks to the system uh, that could lead to heightened political instability uh, and insecurity, which could lead to instability, which in, in turn has the opportunity to exacerbate that humanitarian situation. So just to run through the quick numbers, you know, Ethiopia recently pulled about 3,000 troops out of Somalia to reinforce its military operations uh, against it in, in Tigray. Uh, and, and that's significant, right? I mean, that's a significant chunk of the Ethiopian troops who were in Somalia playing a role in supporting the central government and also inside of Amisam. Um, in fact, Amisam, the, uh, the AU peacekeeping stabilization mission there, is uh, largely dependent on Ethiopian troops. The numbers haven't been drawn down significantly yet. But uh, if we see more, that could really open a tremendous security vacuum in the country. Um, all this is happening as we run up against elections in December uh, 2020 and then February 2021 in Somalia, which are creating a tremendous amount of tension already. Um, and so you couple the Ethiopian withdrawal with the oncoming elections that have signaling from the Trump administration that they're looking to pull out you know, 700 or so special operations troops that are further reinforcing the security situation inside of Somalia. And you've sort of had the recipe for uh, increased instability uh, in a country that can ill afford it. Um, you know, just top line, there's 2.6 million IDPs, 1.3 million food insecure inside of Somalia. And so it's a very delicate situation uh, that now is being forced to endure another shock to the system. So looking at all those, those are sort of like the top line regional issues that we're looking at. When you crank it back to uh, Ethiopia in particular, in terms of advice, the issues that we're watching, the humanitarian response and recommendations, obviously, uh, from a U.S. perspective, we would like to see sort of increased support for the AU peace process. Um, we have seen some statements from the Secretary of State, but they're a little bit, they're a little late in coming. Uh, we think probably more could be done. Um, we're also trying to advocate for increased uh, uh, donor support for the UN humanitarian appeal in Sudan. Um, and I think in the coming days and weeks, along with a number of other groups, we're going to be watching this deal, right, between the Ethiopian government and the UN affording humanitarian access in Tigray. Uh, we really it's going to require a lot of pressure to ensure that Ethiopia walks that talk and that access is reasonably unconstrained. Um, and then finally, going back to a point that Beza raised, really keeping an eye on other conflicts and displacement in different parts of Ethiopia, right? There's, you've had a lot of time and attention and sort of a giant sucking sound at Tigray of drawing in resources. And it, you, know, you have high levels of displacement and high levels of tension in other parts of the country and making sure the humanitarian architecture can pivot and respond to that will be critical going forward. We'd like to see OCHA actually designate or the UN designate a deputy humanitarian corridor uh, coordinator, excuse me, inside of uh, Ethiopia to deal with some of this. 
Um, we understand that USAID is actually strengthening its presence, uh, which is a good news. Um, and depending on how things shake out in Sudan, we may need to see a significant plus up of the humanitarian architecture there as well. So with those points, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Jennifer. Thank you. Uh, fantastic, Cardin. <clears throat> um, uh, great take, and we've had a couple of questions on the regional implications of this. Should add that Sudan itself is in the midst of a still fragile political transition um, that all the factors that you said could, could exacerbate as well. Um, I'm going to turn to Mariam, who's going to kind of lead the Q&A, um, lead off with the first question, but just thank you all for a really um, a great complimentary uh, presentations. So, Mariam, over to you. Thank you so much. Yes, I was going to say the same thing. So thank you very much for a comprehensive overview of the conflict, but also the roots of the conflict. So for those of us who pay a lot of attention to humanitarian crisis, you know, one of the things we always say is there is no such thing as a natural disaster, right? And it's because it's it, they're always complex. They're rooted in underdevelopment, um, in fragility in terms of peacekeeping or peace building, state building, and often conflict dynamics. So I think you all did an excellent job for people who may not pay as much attention to really outline how just because we are now seeing this blip in the media doesn't mean that this crisis was um, you know, not preventable, not predictable, uh, and that uh, there aren't really complex factors coalescing to to bring about this crisis that we are now paying attention to. Uh, so thank you very much for, for underlining that. Uh, one of the approaches that we have at the Humanitarian Action Initiative is to look at the complexity of these crises. So even, you know, Beza's, um, uh, you know, underlying of these different shocks, the climate related shocks, the health related shocks, the political uh, security related shocks, right? The environmental related shocks just shows that we need to have a much more complex approach to these crises, both in the way that we think as academics, but how we approach it in terms of policy. Uh, and, you know, here is where NGOs are very um, at the forefront, so Mercy Corps resilience program, uh, the global fragility packs or, or the, the efforts of different NGOs to kind of push the global fragility uh, pact and get states to actually kind of commit to it um, are really at the forefront of getting us to think in much more complex ways. So the question that I wanted to start off with um, is uh, the so just this week, the United Nations released their global humanitarian overview, right? And um, and it was not a surprise to many of us because we all knew it was going to be awful, their prediction for humanitarian need for this year, because already last year um, when, you know, they always release these predictions for people that don't know the the in the December before for the next year. So it's predictions of need. And so already in 2020, uh, the predictions were extremely high. And this week they released the global, global humanitarian overview for 2021, which predicts a record 235 million people will need humanitarian assistance and protection over the next year, which is a 40% increase over 2020, which was already an increase over the previous year. Um, and so, you know, for those of us who work on these super complex issues, the question always becomes about, you know, Liz said this, Beza, you've all said this, these are, this is predictable. These are preventable crises in many ways, right? So my question for you is, you know, the uh, because you've all indicated this conflict was foreseeable with clear signs that tensions were rising, what will it take to shift from reacting to a situation once violence breaks out to a more preventative model of humanitarian and political transition insistence? How do we get uh, an imperative of prevention in US or other foreign policy? So that's my question for you. Um, and we do have several questions on the regional aspects, so I will also ask those and then I'll hand it over so you can both you can take both questions uh, and then we'll have more Q&A. So in terms of um, the regional aspects, uh, co-director of the Institute for African Studies, um, Ambassador uh, Mula Mula asks, uh, she's asking this of Liz, but of course any of you can answer this question. Thank you for your perspective on the Tigray crisis. Can you say something about why the African Union is hamstrung to play a meaningful role in resolution of this crisis? And Joshua Glow asks a, a similar question in terms of the regional um, aspects. 
what are the broader implications of violence in the Tigray region for East Africa as a whole? So I will hand it over to the panelists. Um, we might just have you go again in the order that you presented. So Liz, if you'd like to begin, and then uh, you know Patrick, um, Beza, and Hardin. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, and thank you, Hardin, for um, you know showing the regional um, aspect of it because this is one of the most you know again. Conflict is violent conflict is never a good thing. It sets countries back for our development assistance for decades. People lose their lives. Um, it, you know, there's nothing good that comes out of violent conflict. Um, so, you know, again, we saw these trends happening. We knew this was happening um, and the international community stood by. I will not put this on the African Union alone. I mean, I will really put this on the international community. One thing we see with the African community that happens, and this is, you know, one of the problems is that a lot of these leaders um, have a lot of the same issues that are going on in their own countries. So it's hard for them to say something, um, you know, one, when they have the same issues going on, um, uh, you know, to point their finger or to say, you can't do this uh, because they're doing the same things um, or having the same issues. So I think that's one of the things that's always hamstrung the AU. Um, again, I'm just gonna say it. I mean, because of the administration here in the United States, uh, you know, Ethiopia is one of its largest aid recipients in Africa. Um, you know, we turning off that spigot just a couple of months ago, um, considering how aid dependent Ethiopia is, is you know absolutely the wrong thing that we could have done again you know showing how important diplomacy is i feel diplomacy has been lacking um you know and we have um afp and mercy corps have co-led the global fragility um uh, act um, that was passed into law last december and one of the key aspects of that is taking a strategy an overarching overarching strategy and looking at a country and a region and saying it's not just about more resources it's not just about more conflict programming you have to address the diplomatic issue you have to address the diplomatic issue and again i'm just going to go back to the issue you know remember how important um you know water is um egypt is not going to let that go this is their source of water again we knew about this dam <laughs> 10 years ago, um, why, you know, once the Ethiopians were gonna come online with it, all of a sudden it becomes this big international in, in, um, issue. So, you know, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna just say, you know, the international has really fallen down on the diplomacy aspect of this. Patrick, would you like to respond to the questions? Yes, um, there are a lot of things have been already uh, already mentioned. I just want to uh, respond to what you said, uh, Marianne. I think on the, such crises are predictable, yes, but most often not preventable. In a way, these are sovereign decisions taken by states after, you know, after wider regional international consultations they're not done you know in abstract or in a vacuum um, and it's not certainly my role to comment on the why uh, such uh, such crisis uh, has taken place but on the how can we prevent it to get worse how can we prevent it to become a protection crisis rather than only a food or a displacement crisis how can we make sure that rule of law but also international law and uh, a culture of the respect of those who have deliberately chosen not to carry weapons and are directly but also indirectly affected by the crisis have to have indeed an overall protection that's what uh, what, what really matters to an organization like ours deeply rooted anchored with local partners and Indeed, if we were in Michele prior and are today stuck in the city, is because we saw that you know happening, and we saw that that the indicators were uh, alarming in a way that we needed to respond to earlier fragilities, 
you know, Liz mentioned, spoke about root causes. If we don't tr treat the root causes, then we keep on being addicted to a kind of a streak of humanitarian assistance rather than looking forward and thinking about developing gains, about building a solid society, bringing back social cohesion, and indeed reminding ourselves that resilience building is a must prior to and during crisis. And that's what we are trying to indeed achieve by having a holistic approach, but also a regional one uh, in Somalia, in Nairobi, in Eritrea, in Sudan. And that, that, that work indeed kind of helps uh, us achieve a co coherent response. Um, so again, that's that's my take on the protection, the, the, the rule of law, and the importance of not looking at it only from a Michele perspective. Looking at the country today, we see a lot of small fires here and there. And that's where we need to be able to sit down and have a dialogue with all those involved in the fighting. Those who we believe can have a direct impact on people's lives and can help uh, you know, prevent this crisis with, to have indeed effects of indesirable but also irreversible nature. Look at, you know, think of those amputees. How will their life be affected? Re again, regardless of the political c considerations that are not of my merits, and I'm not, you know, we need to understand, we need to learn to swim in the sea of politics without being a politician. But in this particular case, just look at the human toll. What's the price for going into such a crisis? And what will do we be able to do afterwards in order to, again, recollect and bring people to a, sta to a stable stance? As, as the situation is unfolding, I see this happening with difficulty, with pain, and certainly with a lot of investment and more money and sweat being given to this uh, crisis. But also, again, as I said, the regional aspect is extremely important. I was recently in Somalia last week, and I've seen firsthand the impact of climate and crisis, the combined effects of climate and conflict. And in this particular region, I'm afraid that we need to heal rather than create even more uh, fractures, and everyone has to play a role, including the uh, the African Union, EGAD, and all the regional organizations, as well as uh, the state of Ethiopia. Thank you. Other panelists would like to respond to these two questions. I just a quick thing. Um, sure, and then and then hard and unmuted muted himself. <laughs> yeah, sorry, just one thing. I, I just want to say though, and I get that the that the um, there's so much going on in the world. It is hard to pay attention um, to one area where you you know the trends come up given what's going on in the world today. However, the report that I wrote earlier this year came about because U.S. government came to me off the record and said, this is a, you know, what's happening here? We can see it all happen. Please, you need to get more attention to this area um, so that we can be pushing, you know, diplomacy and other things forward. So, I mean, that's just an example about how people were like begging us, even from inside the U.S. government to talk about these issues. Thanks, Liz. Hi, um, I'll just jump in here very quickly. You asked one question about the AU and how how it could be effective or how it could be more effective or why perhaps not as effective as it could have been at this point. I mean, I think part of that question, and I'll leave it to experts, uh, political experts and analysts in the region, but I would suspect that if you look at the size of Ethiopia and its political weight and influence inside of the AU and the region as a whole, um, it, it other parts of the regional system or the regional organization attempting to get leverage over Ethiopia uh, in it to drive more sort of uh, a conversation or a political solution here. Uh, I'm not sure that really exists in, in strong amounts. And so there again, back to Liz's point about the need to have the US or other members of the international community who may have some of that leverage engage in a coordinated fashion. And that's now really what's needed, right? I mean, looking forward, from where we are right now, uh, it, you know, if there isn't some sort of political pathway 
right, that sort of established to, to bring in some of these grievances and to sort of talk about how you build concepts of legitimacy between different partners who now consider, or different opponents right now, who consider themselves to be uh, the other one to be illegitimate, so in Tigre and in the national government. If we can't work something there, um, we're in for a pretty rough ride. And I think that uh, just sort of leaving it to the AU to try to do it itself probably doesn't do them a lot of favors, right? And so I think that their US and the US and others can play a significant role, at least behind the scenes in assisting. With respect to the sort of the regionalization of the crisis and the implications, you know, I mean, this has been said a couple of times now when they look at, you know, the, the questions asked, are we looking at uh, a balkanization of uh, Ethiopia? Are we looking at, you know, a, a Syria beginning to unfold in East Africa? You know, the jury is out on that right now, but uh, we should be doing everything in our power to avoid that eventuality, right? So I want to step through, you see the situation of, you know, refugees moving into Sudan in the midst of a transition. Uh, you have Eritrea, which we haven't really talked about, which has now sort of become involved in the margins on this conflict along the border uh, with the exchange of fire and potentially potentially the uh, use of uh, Eritrean troops. And then you pivot to Somalia, where you see an opening of a vacuum and a shifting in international attention because of what's happening in Ethiopia. If we don't approach it from a regional context, uh, we could be in for a particularly rough ride over the next couple of years in the Horn and East Africa uh, writ large. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, this is something I think about a lot, uh, which is at what scale should we be addressing crises, right? And what's really unique about this crisis is it's happening within a larger global pandemic where the international system is already taxed, right? Not only do we have disrupted supply chains, but we can't move people freely. We can't get things uh, where they need to be. Uh, we're we're kind of handling a major crisis. So you know, at an at a global level, while you also have outbreaks of other types of conflict, and so it really raises the question of at what scale, right? It, regional, global, national, local, um, should these actions occur? And I mean, really, I would argue the answer is, well, it occurs at all those scales simultaneously, but different actors have different capacities. So at this regional level, uh, you know, whereas we're seeing the Africa CDC mobilize um, political leadership and mobilize resources at incredible levels uh, to address the COVID crisis, they perhaps, as Hardin says, don't have the political capacity to mobilize at the same way in this crisis. So, you know, where, so who do we go to then, right? Where's the, where, where are the actors that would come in? Um, and because of this water issue as well, you know, you can imagine that on the continent, you actually have these dueling super, you know, regional powers as well, uh, where uh, other other countries might be very, you know, uh, hesitant to to uh, try to leverage any kind of political capacity. So, um, so that's, you know, I think that's a question that we need to figure out um, in terms of the humanitarian and development sector and in. in you know, uh, of having more fine grained ways of where do we make the appeals, right? And where, how are we trying to get um, action mobilized? Beza, did you want to uh, chime in at all on these first questions? Um, sure, I think it's um, largely uh, repeating a few things already, but I mean, I, I tend to agree with what Patrick says in terms of we can't, um, I don't think we'll ever be able to completely prevent uh, situations like this. Um, you know, on the surface, the current crisis in Tigray really relates to the political transition in Ethiopia that started in 2018, and specifically to the rising tensions between the federal government and the TPLF, which were increasing over time. And then there was this trigger in, in early November um, with, the, with the attack on the Northern Command base. Um, I think those those issues are a, a national political issue, as as Patrick said, it, it's a, sort of a sovereign issue. So there's not much um, as as development or humanitarian actors that we can do. Um, I think on the political side, you know, there's diplomacy, there's there's um, yeah mediation and, and those things. But from where we stand, I think our entry point into these challenges is really, as you were saying, Mariam, working at a specific level, which is at the local level, um, and even if these these challenges might be political and national um, on the surface. They really do feed on 
local dynamics and local conflicts. And you, you do see some of that playing out in Tigray, especially the, the tensions between Amara and Tigray in terms of contested lands, let's say, for example. Um, and what Mercy Corps has done, or the organizations like TACT that Liz mentioned in the past, is we were working on um, sort of resolving these, these disputes, again, that revolved oftentimes around access to land, natural resources, um, uh, and we were trying to sort of strengthen local institutions to sort of uh, address those before they devolved into more, um, more intractable types of conflict. Unfortunately, I think funding for those types of programs slowed down um, in the context of the CSO law and then since then haven't really picked up. So there is this, um, I think, missing element on the ground of really trying to address uh, the, the social cleavages that you see at the very local level. Thank you. Uh, we have a lot more questions in the chat. We have two questions that are a little bit more specific. So I'll ask them and then whatever panelists can answer them can just go ahead and you know raise your hand and I, I and unmute yourself. So the first question um, is from Liz Bajalier uh, and she asks, would releasing loan free special drawing rights funds through the IMF to support the COVID-19 crisis help the humanitarian situation? including the intersection of the growing, growing conflict, what other international humanitarian funding is needed? And a second question, who's from one of my students um, at the Elliott School, um, Abdullah Kamara, asks, uh, thank you for all your insights into the Tigray crisis. Would, uh, would you please elaborate on the role of diasporas in this crisis and how they can be leveraged to build peace and stability in the region? Anyone speak to the international financing or IMF question? Just for me, I, I do tend to think it's important in the era of COVID um, in terms of, you know, the economic recovery of African states. But I do think that that's something of a longer term um, impact and that um, less immediate impact on, on this crisis. Uh, I, you know, I think that's a topic worthy of debate and worthy of a panel you know what are the instruments to help draw the continent and um, give them better access to those kinds of financing um, but probably less impactful in this immediate situation sure i'll just jump in really quickly on the world bank question uh, you know the, the bank has established a window an emergency window um, for both grants and concessional loan financing for the emergency response to the covid 19 pandemic uh, and it's doing a lot of work both on everything from social services to uh, economic recovery uh, in places. So it's doing like frontline work quite often in the lane of even traditional humanitarian. Not that it's doing it, but it's loaning money or granting money for that kind of work straight out through the recovery process. And I think it's an incredibly important contribution. The question is, I'm not sure how you would leverage that tool at this stage vis-a-vis -vis the conflict inside the country. And I think that's just something the way the, the bank works on these sort of issues, once they commit, um, uh, it's not something that they're going to go back and sort of uh, and rework based on conflict patterns uh, that are playing out in the short term right now inside the country or even longer term. Um, however, as that moves into sort of longer recovery and economic development questions, if the country is descending into civil war, that's not a point that the, I mean, the bank can't ignore that. So we'll just be back in a different place, but they do have an emergency window, which I think has been reasonably effective at this stage on COVID-19. Um, and, you know, I would just add in here that uh, the, so the UN is negotiating access and as Hardin said, they're going to issue a, um, the global HRP, the humanitarian response plan. So, you know, I, I, I would think that in terms of moving funding, you know, uh, kind of accessing the country based pooled funds or probably surf funding uh, would be the fastest way to kind of move money right now into the area. Um, I haven't looked at, you know, I it's we can't know that yet, uh, but that would be my suspicion is that's how they would move the, the funding very quickly is through the the central emergency relief fund um, surf and then um, and uh, a country based plan, hopefully. Um, so, uh, but, you know, I, I'm just guessing right now. Uh, any anybody want to take on the second question about diasporas? Yeah, I can chime in really quick on that. Um, 
uh, the Ethiopian diaspora, which I, I put myself in that category, is um, I think first very diverse. You know, it's it's a large diaspora, even just in in the U.S. alone, um, and it has been very engaged in um, in in the situation. I think because uh, the diaspora cares a, a lot about what is happening in the country. Um, and it has been engaged in, in in positive ways. I think you know a lot of people have been um, writing to senators, um, have been uh, speaking about the issue in different platforms, um, and and sharing their ideas of what needs to happen in Ethiopia, and have been pushing for for peace um, or ways towards peace. Um, but you also see, uh, you know, the diaspora in some cases tends to be polarized and have very different views, and a lot of that plays out in some in some uh, ways on. Uh, social media, I think, um, and tends to uh, because again, like the information coming out of this immediate crisis is so conflicting and um, uh, and limited, given the sort of communications blackout, um, tends sometimes to heighten tensions. I think so. Um, you know, there have been a lot of concerns about how social media can contribute to further exacerbating the situation, um, and and I think that's one potential sort of area where the diaspora, again, might not have a great um, sort of a, a positive effect at times. But as I mentioned, there's also many, many good things that have come about from the diaspora engaging politically on um, elevating this issue in the eyes of, um, of Americans and other countries where Ethiopians are living. Yeah, and just really quickly to step in, one of the things about the diaspora they have been really helpful on is remittances. And also they have fueled a lot of the economy of building and going back in. And, and so a lot of that has stopped because as the service industry in the US has collapsed, um, you know, people are struggling here as well. So, you know, I think that's another aspect to it. Um, Beza, your point on the disinformation is key. We haven't mentioned it. Um, you know, even the prime minister passed a, a new hate law um, hate speech law, which, you know, people saw as really cracking down, you know, the regression of that political transformation. Um, but the disinformation um, and the um, misinformation and, and the spreading hate has been online, ha has impacted Ethiopia, just like it's happened, you know, impacted everywhere else in the world. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a couple more questions. We still have 10 minutes, so uh, we're, let's keep the conversation going. This is super enlightening. Uh, so Malcolm Russell Einhorn asks, uh, what concrete dimensions of enhanced autonomy in Ethiopia would pay the most dividends for longer term stability in Tigray and perhaps some of the other regional states? And um, Ambassador Mulamula asks uh, a related question, so I'll ask them to, together. Do you see a window for dialogue facilitated by the regional leaders? Anyone? <laughs> sure, I can just kick it off, but I don't have a ton to say on, on these, um, or it's, it's difficult to comment on them. But I mean, I think the um, representation and, and sort of fed, federation issues are, are really, are really um, important in Ethiopia. And it's, you know, it's, it's been uh, on the forefront of uh, the political situation, I think, for the, at least the past 30 years, when, um, when, when the current System, the ethnic federalism was instituted, instituted with um, with the uh, coming of the EPRDF. Um, there are obviously great intentions behind that. I think that this idea of of balancing out some of the exclusion and inequalities um, and grievances, but there are also some, I think, negative consequences that you have seen on the ground. As I mentioned, a lot of these conflicts that occur tend to occur in regional boundaries where there are these disputes over land um, and uh, sort of uh, administrative control of areas um, and because people are it, it's essentially mobilizing people around ethnic identity so um, that is something I think that Ethiopia will continue to reckon with in, in the future but it, it, it's really difficult to comment on what the right way it is yeah and I'll just say the Ethiopians constitution gives the right um, to seek autonomy um, and to more to more than 
80 ethnic different groups in Ethiopia. Think about that. I mean, we don't know how that's going to play out. We know how that played out in Sadama, but that's a big unknown. Okay, um, so we have one last question here. Uh, since both the U.S., uh, this is from Townsend Cock, um, since both the U.S. and China have significant interests, economic, military, etc., in the region, do the current increased diplomatic tensions between the U.S. and China present a barrier to a negotiated resolution of the conflict? Well, remember, the U.S. cut off assistance recently, um, so we don't really know what's happening there. Um, the only real assistance that's going in there right now is humanitarian assistance. But yes, I mean, and that's been our argument. If the U.S. pulls out, China is there um, uh, and also causing some of these regional conflicts that Beza is talking about in Gambella, for example. Um, you know, it was the Chinese um, and the Indians going in and... Um, you know, once we we stabilized the region, we had done a lot of work there in terms of stabilization, building peace agreements, um, the organization I was working with PACT. Um, the problem is once we did that, what happened? A lot of, you know, these companies came in from China and India and were displacing people, um, you know, palm oil, rice, um, and so that's the biggest problem is when areas get stabilized in this region. In the past, the federal government has just let them come in. I mean, because the Chinese have given a lot of loans for roads and that sort of thing that the EPRDF did a good job on. Um, uh, the problem, though, is that when we pull out, which is what we have just done, um, who, you know, who comes in? Um, and so, you know, this is this is a serious problem that the U.S. hopefully under the new administration, um, you've seen some good signs under the new administration. Um, Tony Blinken, who is the new um, secretary, will be the new secretary of state, has actually been tweeting on this issue. Um, so that's a good sign that the U.S. might seriously reengage. So have uh, Patrick and um, Beza, have your organizations uh, seen any money coming in from the Chinese government in terms of support for humanitarian work? Because they often bypass the international mechanisms. We wouldn't really see that. Well, in our definition, they don't bypass. They just go in a different way. They choose to go bilateral. They've done so for the COVID response with uh, a support that, as you've seen in the beginning, end of March, uh, you know, transiting, going through Ethiopia for the rest of uh, the continent. We've been in touch recently with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, indeed for other related matters, and had uh, presented the, the, the situation in Ethiopia as the most uh, urgent um, environment to tackle. Um, yes, there are certainly uh, more money coming in, more assistance. But that has been indeed done bilaterally between the government of Ethiopia and the, and the Chinese government. And we've seen also at least the announcement that was made to support the UN uh, work in, uh, in Sudan. But I have no other uh, information on specifically that, that donorship of China. What I do see, by, uh, however, is there, there is an interest from a lot of other states. We've been contacted as the ICRC and the Red Cross movement as a whole. Uh, although it's the end of the year and it's extremely complicated to get in a 2020 financial health of all of our donor states is increasingly diff being difficult. Um, we do see indeed a, a solidarity, uh, as we've seen in the beginning of the COVID crisis, solidarity around uh, putting people at the center and not the states or the intentions of parties or, uh, you know, uh, the the grains that that's 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 not what our donorship looks at. Uh, there indeed, what I've been hearing and seeing are again um, testimonies for human stories that they're hearing from the ground, and that has been indeed rewarding. Again, I'm talking at the beginning of December, where our donors are indeed uh, not as uh, agile as they would do at the beginning of a year. Thank you. Yeah, that's hopeful to hear about global solidarity, given some of the rhetoric, right, that we, we hear. 
Beza, do you have any sense of whether, no? Okay. And so, um, Miriam, they tend yes. to, so they really focus in on loans um, and that's what they provide, so. Yeah, thanks. Right. And that's, you know, that goes back to the infrastructure pro programs and, and, and some of the longer term development. Um, OK, so Jennifer, we're at time. Should we close up here? Sure. Um, I thank everybody. I mean, it's a it's it's a worrisome picture still. I mean, I think the resistance of both sides to uh, consider dialogue because it would legitimize the other is going to make you know the African Union's job and the diplomatic job very much harder. And the worry is this has become a kind of long protracted war of attrition or guerrilla war. Um, does it have the destabilizing effects that Hardin pointed to in Somalia with the drawdown of Amazon troops? Uh, the outflows, the compounding fragility in an already fragile Sudan. Um, and then finally, the, you know, kind of what we've been focused on, the humanitarian, um, the civilians who are caught in this. Um, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful to you all for kind of raising attention, um, uh, kind of letting us know what you're hearing on the ground. I hope this becomes the subject, uh, gets a lot more attention in, in Washington, in the GW community, um, as we kind of try to find political solutions, yes, but also addressing the very human needs that are at the heart of it. So, um, you know, thank you all and thank you to our audience for there's some unanswered questions that are all very good, but we're, we're limited in time. So um, thank you and thank you, uh, Mariam. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you very much to all of our panelists for joining us for this really enlightening conversation. And uh, we will let you know if there's any follow up from uh, our audience members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys.